Yeah. All right, so then let's start uh, and dive into the nature of a lightweight design. So, um, let me go. All right, <laughs> this is just uh, the intro picture. Um, most of you that I are familiar with biomimicry, but still I want to start with uh, an explanation about what is biomimicry. Imagine yourself on a sunny day when you're walking out in the mountains on a hike and just hanging out in the sun and enjoy yourself, then you probably wouldn't think of a hippopotamus. But it turns out that the sweat of a hippo is the perfect sunscreen. It's um, UV, UVA and UVB resistant. It's, of course, water resistant. It's antiseptic, antifungal, and even insect repellent. So what a perfect sunblock would that be? OK, um, I guess um, most of you, they, are thinking, I don't want to smell like a hippo sweating. But imagine you just go into the lab and examine this sweat and what are the ingredients of it, and then synthesize it, and maybe put some drops of uh, coconut oil into it. What a nice product that would be. And this process we call biomimicry. So you observe nature very closely learn from it and then you take the wisdom you have from it and solve your problem with that. So that's what we do when we talk about biomimicry or when we do biomimicry basically. So now when we talk about lightweight design, um, there are many, many uh, models and also uh, examples in nature that you should observe and are really, 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 really um, worth it to explore. So, uh, sorry, Patrick, if I yes. may just ask a question, like a very basic question. How would you define lightweight design? What is lightweight design to you exactly? Thank you. It's just to make um, things light. <laughs> right, but we come to that. So if you um, Lightweight means that you uh, yeah, make things light. So like a bird or a skeleton of a bird. It's really, I mean, birds, they need to be very light. They fly around in the sky. So that's a very good example of being light. So another thing are diatoms. These are really, really small. These are quite magnified here in this picture. Um, this is, these are skeletons of single cellular organisms, basically. So, and they have a very sophisticated forms because they are around since billions of, of years on our planet. So they have had a lot of time to um, do um, development and, uh, and research. And that's why they look so sophisticated. And um, there are a lot of uh, wisdom or for three-dimensional like designs, that's a very, very good uh, model to use when you uh, want to do something like that. Then seeds with uh, these hairy structures around to spread all over the world, that makes them really, really light. And these hairy filaments around the seed they make it fly far for kilometers wide because it's just hanging in the air basically. And with a, a, the littlest air current, it flies very, very far. So that's another approach to lightweight design. Then a very nice model is read. Um, it's for you architects that are listening, it's a very, very nice model for slim and tall structures. So reed is um, also very light and um, 
withstand basically any storm. So uh, these are really, really uh, nice structures, this layered structure to make this uh, reed uh, so sturdy and um, light at the same time. So that's uh, a very uh, exciting model. Then trees, of course, the branching of trees and uh, especially also how the tree is growing with uh, is a very, very nice model to show how you use the least amount of material to get the most strength out of it. And it's also uh, the main part of my presentation and what I want you to learn today. <laughs> All right. So when we talk about lightweight design, why should we do that? What's the benefit of lightweight design? Um, of course, you when you do lightweight design, you use less material. And um, if you if you would do a lightweight design really properly in the built and industrial industry, you could reduce 74% of steel. That's from a study that was done uh, in just the built and industrial industry. That's worldwide. So this uh, would be 163 million tons of CO2 you could um, save per year. So when you talk uh, about big numbers, I always um, give some uh, like a comparison. So 163 million tons is a big number, <laughs> but this is about four times the whole CO2 um, production uh, or yeah, that we do in Switzerland. So, so that's quite a lot. I mean, Switzerland is a small country, but this is, uh, yeah, it's quite, and this is from the whole world, like the steel and aluminum from the whole world compared to the four, is four times as much that you could save. So, all right. So another um, benefit when you, uh, are lighter, then it's really, really um, a benefit for all the moving things. So when you move something around and it's lighter, then you use just less energy. So for cars, for example, if a car is 10% lighter, you, uh, yeah, that results in six to 8% in fuel reduction. So if you um, move in transportation, the things you transport and also the vehicle, if that is lighter, you save energy. So that's also a big issue nowadays. And also, if you are lighter, you can accelerate much faster with less energy and enhance performance of um, like, that's what um, I use or we use in automation. There, the processes in the fact and manufacturing have to be faster and faster. And so you have to make it as light as possible to make it uh, economical also. And there, these are the three main um, uh, benefits. And then there are many others, like uh, if uh, you have uh, lighter products and systems, you uh, have better safety because the kinetic energy is lower. That's some other examples. Um, okay, so now how can biomimicry help us in this way? And uh, here I want to just add just the difference when we talk about humans and nature. <laughs> I mean, humans belong to nature, but um, humans do things differently than the rest of nature, so to say. And um, they also innovate differently than nature does. Uh, and this is a study or a plot that comes out of a study of um, uh, thousands of patents that were examined how did the what was the innovation in these patents? What were what were the ingredients in these patents for this innovation? And it's just put in this uh, chart here, and you see 
the biggest part is this red part and this is energy so people use a lot of when they solve a problem the most thing they use is energy then the second biggest is the yellow part here substance that means material basically so humans solve problems with uh, in they use material and energy <laughs> and so sometimes some other stuff and the orange part is interesting uh this is information or it's basically information processing it's not used that much in humans innovation so let's see how nature does it then we see oh it's quite differently there's uh some two other colors that are yeah it's more distributed but the orange is here very prominent and gray so orange is information processing and gray structure so then when we talk about lightweight design we talk basically about structure so then it's really nice to have um, yeah lightweight structure when you innovate something if you want to have um, some thing that is um, really supporting life because nature is supporting life most of the time not most of the time always actually <laughs> all right and then the Maybe you uh, ask yourself, what's information processing? What does that mean? And that it's basically all the sensing that's going on. So like um, sensing weight and light, uh, nature is growing and acting and reacting to light and uh, like forces like wind or gravity or uh, uh, humidity, all these things. Um, the reaction to all the your surroundings to the context so nature is all is very very much um adapted to any, anything that goes around and then um, to its context and so that's like the all the senses that are used and that's meant by information processing all right so here you see the direct um comparison so Humans innovate by with material and energy, and nature does it with uh, mostly structure and information processing. Okay, so here we have our first example of a um, natural model for lightweight design, a bone. Um, bone is um, formed in a way that it perfectly um, just withstands the forces that are adapted to it. And um, it's there where you have a high tension, you have a lot of material, and there where you have low tension, you have less material. And also the bones, it's a living object. It's a living organism or organ almost. And um, it's, um, that you uh, uh, see when the bone is broken then it um, it grows together again and on the broken part there there's a lot of material is added and then after some time it's also taken away again and also when you look inside the bone you see the there you have the, the inside structure so you have in nature always the outer shape and inside there's uh, uh, also a very um, sophisticated structure that is also uh, you can also say this is information processing because um, the structure is according to the force uh, the grown to withstand the force uh, uh, in the right way and also in a really optimized way so uh, now a little bit about myself i'm a mechanical engineer and um, uh, one of the things i'm doing is um, i do research and development uh, especially development for trains or railway railroad um, systems the trains um, most of it anything that has to do with the trains and uh, 
especially also the wheel sets and wheel set frames and all around the wheels. And there we had um, a project uh, for a locomotive. And this is the wheel frame of a locomotive without any axles. The, you see the small blue lines here. That's just where the axles are. They are um, not on, on it here. Oh, <laughs> we don't go there yet. So. <clears throat> Now I have this, my laser pointer here, so, okay. And um, this is a, a finite element calculation plot. That means it's a, the, a strength calculation of this uh, wheel set frame of this locomotive. And um, then the, the designers of this um, frame came to me and told me, ah, we have here in this corner, we have too high tension. So maybe you, I have to explain a little bit this uh, plot, how, what it says. We have here the tension of this frame. There's, there are applied loads of, on the frame and then you make the calculation. And then afterwards you see where do you have high tension and where do you have low tension. Uh, everywhere that it's red, you have high tension and there where it's blue, there is low tension. So red is bad, blue is good, and red, uh, green is in the middle. That's also good still. But here you see this red spot. So this is was uh, the issue. And then how humans solve problem? You add more material. <laughs> but you have also restrictions because here in this frame, uh, the, you have the weight limits and uh, it was already at the limit. We we couldn't add more weight and uh, you could uh, change the form but there you have also restrictions because there are many uh, other th stuff that is not you not see it on this uh, chart here because it's just the frame here the welded steel frame and everything is not is you you need to add the engine and the wheels and the axles and all the electric components and stuff. So the space is really limited and the weight is also limited. That's a really basic problem we have in engineering. And well, then I said, trees are doing it like that. So when you look at the tree stem, how it grows, you see from the forest floor, then you see here, we have this 45 degree angle where the stem, the, basically the roots come out from the ground and then it's moving it out to the main direction of the tree. So to the vertical of the tree. So uh, this is really typical, uh, the 45 degree angle and then it's moving it out to the uh, vertical of the tree. Then when we look at it in uh, like a theory, th theoretical way uh, of this problem. So we have uh, here uh, basically like a tree. So when we say this is the base and this would be the stem. And then we have a force that is acting to it. Then we see uh, when we have a sharp corner then there is red, so red is bad, blue is good. We have here high tension just in the sharp edge. That's like, okay, yes, I can see that. Uh, but what happened? So we have here these four steps. What happened when we just make a 45 degree angle instead of a sharp corner? And then we see, okay, it's a little bit better, but still I have here this uh, red spot that is not good. But here below, that's now really nicely now. And then number three, that was the work of an engineer. It's a radius. <laughs> and the engineer, they love to make radiuses. But still, it's, it's, it's better. But still, we have here this red spot, as we saw before on this uh, steel frame of this locomotive. And number four, here we have the tree structure. And now you see the red spot is gone. 
it's still a little bit uh, orange here, but that's okay. But like the distribution is much nicer, especially if you compare it to the sharp edge, but also um, it's the best solution when we just use uh, the natural tree structure. So <clears throat> it's just here in detail. And then this is like the frame after the redesign of it. And then now you see here in this square, we see here also pretty much like the tree base structure. Here on the right, it's a, a little bit uh, magnified. And then you see it's no more red spot in this part. And this was really the thing they were really struggling and they were very happy that they could solve the problem with that. And um, yeah, and okay, could make really this project a success. And now this locomotive is running somewhere on the world. I'm not sure where exactly, <laughs> but yeah, this is really, it was a really nice project. Uh, we could do uh, some uh, biomimicry shaping of uh, this locomotive frame. And um, even it doesn't really seem so light, this frame, but it's kind of uh, at this, it's uh, on a, on the, in this part, it's kind of like you, we used um, the principle of lightweight design. Here again, uh, in detail, just to the comparison of the tree and of this part of this uh, locomotive frame. And if you lay this tree over, you see it's it's quite a it's a really uh, quite nice fit. <laughs> so now you should learn something today, and um, here is just how you do this shape. And actually, it's um, you can you can do it really really easily so if you have a corner and you have here this load in uh, this direction so this is the tension direction or the pulling direction um and yeah this method is the method of tension triangle and it's invented by klaus mattek klaus mattek is a german uh, professor of uh, failure analysis and in structures. Yeah, he's retired by now, but he invented this method. And it's really, uh, we did it in the locomotive, we did it exactly with this principle and exactly like that. So um, it's really useful. And um, the engineers that I teach are using it. So, <laughs> but uh, anybody can use it because it's a, uh, uh, quite simple. So we just uh, make in the sharp corner, you add this 45 degree triangle. Then on top of that, you put another triangle and just you start in the middle of this hypotenuse and um, put another triangle, uh, uh, how you say, uh, with equal legs here, triangle with equal legs on top of that. So we have this shape here. And then the third step is you put another one, another triangle and do it uh, the same way. You start in the middle of this hypotenuse and make a, a equal legged triangle here on top of it. And with this shape, you have um, over 95% of the optimized structure for the maximum strength with the least amount of material. And to make it a little bit uh, or one uh, step nicer or better, then you just round all this. Here you still have these uh, corners here, 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 and here. And just put a radius in these corners and then you're set. Then you can go on to the next corner. <laughs> so that's just a really, really easy principle, but it's it's very useful and um, uh, we use it quite a lot. And <clears throat> this is when you have a sharp corner to add something, but sometimes uh, you also can use the same to take it 
material away. So because lightweight is anchored, you take material away. <laughs> All right. Here we have this rectangular beam. It's attached here on the left side on the wall. And you pull on this end just uh, toward uh, the uh, perpendicular to this beam. And then you can use here basically the same method. You have here this uh, 45 degree triangle and the, then here the triangle number two and number three. And you can just take away all this material here and you have the same strength as here, but you're maybe about 30% lighter already. So this is a, also an easy way to uh, reduce weight. And then you can go one step further and take away material of the inside. And this is uh, looks then something like that. And then you may be saying, oh, now, but that's really complicated. But you, if you look closely, you recognize this is the shape here of this triangle, this tension triangle. You see this shape also here and also here. And, and also on from just from, if you, from the bottom up, it's also here. And here is also the same shape and also here the same shape. So we just can uh, more or less uh, add all these uh, triangles and to it. And it's just a, com a combination of different tension triangles. And then you again uh, make this structure. This is a little bit <laughs> uh, yeah, more complicated, I have to admit, but still it's the same principle. So. That's the nice thing about it. It's almost like in the in the inside of the bone, or you have like you have also these structures that look similar to that. <clears throat> and uh, when you take away material from the inside, you talk about hierarchical structures. So let me explain that a little bit. So uh, here, the zeroth order, you have just one beam. And here, the first order, we have here this um, octahedron. And this octahedron is just made out of uh, 12 of these beams. So we have to or around, and then these are all the same beam. And so this is just, uh, let's say, the main structure. And then when you want to take out the material of, of the inside, you can do it like that that you just take this octahedron and make it here and make put it here and just add a lot of octahedrons and make another big octahedron or <laughs> just uh, vice versa make this very small and just uh, that you have at the end the same size of this and this octahedron but just with the uh, inside structure also of little octahedrons and then you can do it again and make you the same step just with this octahedron and then you can go on and on and on this is called hierarchical structure and um, it's also a way uh, to do um, a lightweight design and it's also you see that also a lot in nature that you do the uh, all these nested components things maybe not uh, as a octahedron <laughs> um yeah it's actually it's a uh, yeah nothing our main says this is the structure of the vacuum so and the vacuum is this nat natural maybe <laughs> but that would be another webinar <laughs> all right but let's go back to our tension triangle it happens that this uh shape of this tree uh, you see all, uh, all around in nature so you see it in trees as we saw but you see it also in bones so there's the same shape you find in bones and also in tooth so of this wild pig or also in horns of animals and even in non-living things so like this the base of this rock face 
or in this sediment. So in erosion structures, you also see the same shape. And when you have something like that, then it's really exciting because it's many species and also like plants and animals and also non-living species use or, or the occurrence is of the same thing all around, then we talk about a universal principle. So then it's really exciting because then it must be really something that um, is uh, very precious. And um, so when uh, you make a design with uh, the least material for maximum strength, then this is it. <laughs> and um, maybe you think, okay, yeah, you can make really, really nice designs and very sophisticated and how to manufacture that. And this is really the nice thing of nowadays because nowadays, nowadays the manufacturing like innovation, they made the last say 10 to 20 years, big leaps in innovation and um, now with uh, like the multi-axle, like five axle milling and turning or like the, the 3D printing or uh, all these uh, technologies that you really can make basically anything you want and all the shapes are possible and not uh, really uh, much more expensive than just uh, if you have straight lines. So that's really the nice thing about today. So it's really a lot, a lot is possible. It's almost nothing impossible to manufacture today. And also, if you do something lightweight design, it's another very, very nice benefit. It just looks very elegant and nice. And here's some uh, architectural examples and the Eiffel Tower of course is um, uh, a very nice example of this hierarchical structure of lightweight design. So we have here like the main beam, then you see here these crosses of like the first order um, hierarchical structure and also in these beams you have again these uh, cross beams. So that would be the third order of um, hierarchical structure. So it's nothing new. It, uh, I mean, it, uh, Eiffel Tower is about 140 years old and um, uh, people knew that uh, uh, like uh, already uh, since a long time. And nevertheless, it's really uh, maybe forgotten sometimes, but it, it's really nice uh, or uh, rewarding and a lot of benefits to do lightweight design. And here's some other, like this is uh, Calatrava, as you know, uh, if you are a little bit into art, or yeah, uh, a lot of you know, I think. Or here, the Gaudi, uh, this is in Barcelona, the Sagrada Familia. It's also a very nice um, way of uh, this uh, branching structures that uh, Gaudi is using. And Calatrava, he is also using the tension triangle form all over the place here and everywhere in the, his columns and stuff. And then here, this table uh, inspired by a giant water lily. This is uh, Michael Paulin. And he is doing a lot of um, uh, uh, also um, of this uh, uh, tension triangle shapes and uh, also nested components, these hierarchical structures. and. He's uh, also very, very, very um, has a lot of biomimicry um, uh, projects that he is doing. Then in the more in the mechanical engineering realm, where I came come from, and um, like if you do all the transportation things like cars or bicycles or airplanes or some protection gear, and uh, yeah, same here. It's just it's looks really elegant and <laughs> you save a lot of energy and make things lighter. So use less material. And um, yeah, that's really the benefit of lightweight design. And 
yeah, it just looks really cool and nice. <laughs> that's also yeah, nice way to see it. And that's what inspires me also to really use lightweight design techniques and methods. All right, I come to the end of my presentation and um, I have three things that I want you to remember of my presentation, of course, the tension triangle and uh, the method, how to do it. So I hope, um, uh, yeah, you will use it someday. <laughs> then that nature innovates basically in, uh, yeah, using a really sophisticated structure or intelligent, clever structure and information processing. And if you are inventing something, think about that. And it's just elegant. If you do lightweight design, it's elegant. It's taking the minimum of material to fulfill, to fulfill the function. So, do you have any questions? If anyone has any questions, I would really encourage you to just unmute yourself and ask Patrick directly, or you could also write in the chat and we could ask him. So, do I see any questions? Uh, hi, Patrick, Michaela here. Hi. Uh, I just joined uh, a few minutes ago. Um, sorry, I hope you did not answer that question before. But this very elegant uh, way of arranging uh, nested components and using less and less material um, probably also has an impact on the price of the objects that are designed. Um, is it making it more expensive because there's more work done on it? Or is it doing it less expensive because there's less material? Well, the work is more and the material is less so <laughs> it depends as anything it depends and um if you um and uh, if it depends on many things let's say if you're doing a series um if you do it like then the work you do once but if you produce it many many times then the production is um like um uh, then you don't have like the work, uh, like the thinking work anymore or the engineering and uh, you can automate the production. So then it's really, if you have high series, then um, it's uh, most of the time worthwhile because then when you have uh, like millions of pieces that you're making, then the material price is very prominent. And um, if you have just a small series, say 100, then the material price is not so um, prominent. Then, yeah, then it's somewhere it changes. So um, that's one way. Or the other thing is when you really have big products or big um, components, then also the if you can reduce their material it's also uh, reducing the whole price it's maybe you can say it's always uh, depending on how much uh, from like the engineering and the end product what percentage is the material price and um, then uh, you can say, okay, when you have a high percentage of material, then of course it's worthwhile. And um, if not, then uh, probably not. But it's just, uh, yeah, it's just when you talk about money. <laughs> I mean, there are other uh, like values maybe to think about like uh, CO2 um, footprint or CO2 production. So that is not calculated in any like economical calculation but um yeah maybe uh, someday it's uh, also a very uh high value to consider thanks very much 
Um, Jamilile, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? I see your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, most appreciate it. Um, I, I just wanted to check uh, because you did mention that uh, at some point the process can be automated uh, uh, for purposes of manufacturing. But I'm curious more about the design stage. Uh, now that the ratios are known, do you know if anyone has come up with uh, a sort of modeling so that uh, once you, you, you have your sizes or measurements, uh, you, you, you can easily do the drawing. I would imagine in the traditional engineering drawing, you'd have your, your compasses and, and, and what are they called? Uh, yeah, the, 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 the traditional drawing instruments to, to arc the, 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 the distances and things, but I'm sure there could be a way to calculate as well. Do you know if anyone has come up with a model where you can plug in your dimensions and, and get a nice drawing out of it? Yes, uh, when I understand you right, um, you mean that like you have, um, say, uh, the example of this, just this beam, this uh, rectangular beam, and then you have there this force, and then you have uh, an algorithm that is making just the shape by itself. You Yeah. Yes, yes, there are. This is, um, uh, it's, there are many different um, like uh, methods that uh, are done. And yeah, there's, there are more and more um, software programs that do that. And you can, you just um, can say the program, okay, here you, we have like the boundaries. So there we need the material or maybe because you have like the attachment points, you want to have the attachment points right there. And then on the other side, you have like this force you need to uh, take care of. And then in between, it's like kind of, uh, you don't know actually, and then you can just put the bottom and say optimize. <laughs> and then the, like the computer does it like all this really, uh, this shape, uh, there are, uh, some methods. One met method is called soft kill. So it just takes away all the material that is not used. And um, <clears throat> and uh, or so, some other um, uh, optimization algorithms. So there are different algorithms that you could use. And yeah, uh, it's really, it's uh, coming more and more. And yeah, yeah, this is possible nowadays. And then of course, what, uh, uh, is it's really interesting uh, to see then there also these tension triangle structures, even if you just let the algorithm do it by itself. So it's really, uh, yeah, it's a really uh, universal principle. So some yeah, other thanks. questions? Um, yes, we have a question from Lydia. Would you like to repeat it or shall I read it out? Okay. All right, so Lydia would like you to explain once again the slide where you showed the perpendicular force, like the vertical one. She would ask you, she would like you to explain that picture again and how you can remove the internal material. She also asks, can it be random? I think it was slide 25. Uh, yes, just let me see. So this one. Um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> um, uh, like, It's, um, you see here, um, the, a little bit the shape of this, uh, triangles, the first one to take away this, this is uh, like, uh, the easiest to think of it. Then you start just in this, basically in this corner and, uh, make this, uh, the second, this one, and this one, 
And this, it, you don't see it here, but this here is, it would be also from the third triangle would here be this spot. Then you come down on this one. You make the shape, the triangle shape down here. And then um, for the one they came, they come here, down here, you, it's always, you uh, go from the corners, you see? You just, um, uh, yeah, go from corner to corner of all these triangles. Okay, I understand. And that's, I was uh, curious because uh, the one on the right, the, the one above, uh, isn't the triangle anymore. So, but it's the triangles that are, it's the, const the, the material that is the triangle, not, not the whole. Um. The hole is not shaped as a triangle anymore. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah. It's yeah, the material the... that is the shape of a triangle over and over again. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's the question. Thank you very much. Good question. Thank you. <laughs> and a great, great presentation. I love it. Oh, thank you. More questions? Any other questions? Yes, uh, Patrick, uh, Catherine there. So I have a question. I was, uh, I'm curious. So would you say that this kind of lightweight structure because we have convinced her of this interest and uh, so would you say that this uh, lightweight structure is frequent, frequent now in the industry, for example, in the in transportation uh, or cars have, uh, do they consider uh, this lightweight uh, structure uh, usually or is it something that you, you found, we can find it everywhere in the, in, in the automobile industry, for example? Uh, it's, it's somewhat used. Um, uh, you have um, like, uh, also there are say automobiles, there are um, some of them or yeah, are trying to do uh, lightweight, uh, lighter vehicles. And, um, but it's, it's there like uh, the, there are some, I think some French automobile, um, uh, automobiles are doing it and some Germans. I know that uh, some like the wheel, um, how you say, there where the wheels are attached and the uh, suspension these uh, brackets, they um, used it on that. I think I'm not sure if it was um, uh, Mercedes, I guess, they did something like that. But it's actually, it's you don't see it a lot. It's, um, yeah, what, what they do, they just make uh, the, the sheet metals um, thinner and, uh, and the, what they do sometimes the out, the outer shapes, they make the lightweight structures on the outer shape, but not like the to take the inside out. The that's really really rarely done. Sometimes you uh, you see some like parts in the automobiles that are done like that, but but really not many. So you you cannot say it's done like a lot. Okay. Um, and also um we um. Uh, we do it just uh, when we uh, have projects, but actually we are rarely asked about to make things really light. So it's Would not... you say it's because of the price or because is it more expensive to do it or why? It... <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. It's um, most of the time it's uh, because you don't have time. Because it's a little bit time consuming to do it and um, the strength calculations also get a little bit um, more intense and uh, more difficult and and sometimes it's also that it's hard to fit it with the standards because uh, especially if you're uh, working in trains or also automobiles you need everything needs to be according to standards and um, 
I mean, you could do lightweight design, but then you need to prove your uh, your uh, strength analysis has to comply with the standards. And then sometimes when you have these uh, forms, they're not they're not in the standards, and so you have uh, no uh, like official reasoning to um, like analyze this. Uh, forms uh, just in your press uh, just in your calculations and um, compliance for the standards and uh, strength analysis so that's an, sometimes an issue but um yeah it's mostly time and sometimes also um then they have to change their production i mean it's possible but they have to change it <laughs> and they don't like to change especially if if you are uh, dealing with uh, like uh, companies that they are used to to manufacture series like cars or or other uh, convenient products then they have like their their manufacturing lines and stuff and they don't want to change them and if we, if you have some new i mean this then this is a new technology basically a new manufacturing technology and it's not uh, more expensive necessarily but to change something is somewhat expensive for them i mean the, the change um uh, per se but they also it's like human you don't like to change <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you thank you Patrick. do we have more questions i want to quickly jump in here sorry go ahead emrick <laughs> sorry i forgot we still had the glasses <laughs> i'll take those off <laughs> We just wanted to say thank you for the um, presentation. It was very inspiring. And thank you very much. We were, we were, oh, I can't get rid of the glasses. However, I don't, I I don't have that we've already begun cool to look at how we can implement these lessons at home. So yeah. this is what, Great. what we were inspired. I hope we managed to use the curvature mm -hmm. well. We look forward to speaking to our first investors. Okay. All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We at least managed to get a long curvy extension bridge out of the idea. So thank right. you. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or inputs from anyone? I would like to jump in here quickly and say thank you to all of those who have filled in or who have given us your feedback. We really love to learn from you and to uh, know who uh, to invite and what to do. So uh, please, if you have two minutes, do fill the feedback form so that we can learn and improve the webinars. Thanks. Okay. I okay. Think I have a very general question is, did you know before you started learning about biomimicry that this was the problem you wanted to tackle or did, is it something that came along years of experience? Like what prompted you at least, or in other words, what prompted you to start learning about biomimicry? Um, it was, I was just, uh, I came to biomimicry just by chance basically um i was interested in it uh, like uh, this um, or more in biology and then uh, i learned about uh, biomimicry over um, some articles i read and so then i followed just the biomimicry and then um, i had the chance to make this education and um, so i came to it but it is just I didn't plan. <laughs> it was no plan to to uh, do it, and uh, but I'm really, really uh, glad that I found biomimicry, not only because of lightweight design and all the other mythology, but of, of uh, much more because it's all about biomimicry or the 
is about uh, systemic thinking and that's what um, makes it so uh, precious for me because it gives you the whole picture and um, that's also um, like when we talk about the lightweight design then it's always it's it's one part of the whole and um, at the end uh, it's the whole or the whole product and where it's placed what's the content where it's used this is uh, the important thing and all around it and it's also about um, this information processing and intelligence so that um, you um, react to the your surrounding and the content and uh, that's what makes uh, biomimicry so uh, worthwhile because it's always considering that everything is um, has an impact on anything else so and uh, when we think like that yeah then we can solve any problem i think <laughs> mm -hmm. so and uh, it's it's also a very nice way of thinking of any problem not only in uh, engineering it's also in uh, any like uh, all the social problems or issues uh, or personal stuff and also like life as a whole it's really um and yeah mindset well thank you for that great answer do we have <laughs> any more questions in the house okay so i see we're past our time uh, on behalf of biomimicry switzerland i'd like to first of all thank patrick for this great webinar and my pleasure uh, yes, thank you to everyone who's made it here. Uh, please do take out a minute of your time to fill in the feedback form. But otherwise, I wish you all a nice evening. Yes, I uh, thank everybody for listening and joining. It was very nice to see some of you again since a long time. <laughs> it's very nice. Have and a nice we... evening. We do know who is going to be our next speaker. So, Venetia, would you like to share with your audience, with our audience, our next speaker and the topic of our webinar next time? Yes. Oh, just give me a minute. Sorry. So, for those of you who are still with us, our, in next month we have Hugo Araujo, who will be our speaker. So Hugo has curated many different tools and these tools have been used in many different countries. He's the founder of Seventh Vortex. It's an online tool and based in Belgium. So Hugo had a deep connection with nature and he used this connection and his experience when he came in contact with some indigenous cultures to build the tools that he's made already and the ones that he's working on. In his talk, he will be talking about how he used this biomimicry thinking process to come up with these tools. And he will also be showing you examples on how you could curate your own knowledge ecosystem using these tools. But along, along the way, he would also give you some insights on how you could learn from ecological interactions in nature and use that for your knowledge ecosystems. So please do follow our social media channels and you will know or sign up for our newsletter and you will be informed when the registrations open up again for the next webinar. So. So, any other questions from anyone? Maybe it's time to jump in as well. I would like to thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I really You're appreciated welcome. it and have learned something new. That's very interesting. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs> I'm glad you could learn something. <laughs>
Thank you.